Now the third context is information. And this is by far the most important context. It's probably the most neglected in terms of uh, the teaching of digital technologies. But in industry, 95% of all solutions and problems and applications of digital technologies have, for, have a strong relationship with information. Now, most of these aspects interrelate with coding and with automation, with devices. So there's very much an intermingling, but there are also some specific information-based um, approaches and problems and techniques as well. The first thing you need to teach students about, though, is how data can be stored. Um, data logging, how we access data and bring it in, and how we store it. So students will be, need to learn about binary, uh, the zeros and ones of how we store digital information, but also how that information can be stored in other ways and communicated in other ways. How images can be stored as binary. How video can be stored as binary. But other mechanisms for um, transmitting information, such as Unicode and ASCII, can be used to represent information as well. How letters can be stored in binary, how numbers can be stored in binary. But there's also other aspects of um, data transmission as well, such as semaphore with flags or braille, um, Morse code. These are other representations of data using different systems other than binary. And of course, we have our more traditional um, uh, traditional um, hexadecimals and binary and decimal based um, coding of numbers and utilize that for coding of letters as well by giving each letter a code. So a lot of this has to do with coding. And we'll talk a bit about this when we get to some of the aspects around encryption. But students need to understand that data and information is very malleable. We can do a lot with it. We can change it. We can make, uh, and computers can do a lot with this data as well. But it needs to be in the format that the computer can work with. So one other aspect we teach is around compression of data. Um, you would have all used zip files and things like that to compress data. But how does that work? How does it go about actually making a data file smaller without losing any information? And there are various techniques that are used to do that. And how that is then stored is what we call codecs. And the most common would be used for that is around um, pictures and video codexes where a picture stored as a bitmap or a JPEG or a GIF is stored in a different way. Likewise, um, MP3s are stored in a different way. MP4s are a way of storing video. But there's a whole range of other codexes for video based upon their compression processes and the, the codes that are used to make that data understandable when it needs to be viewed in different ways. So they're things that you'll go through and explore with your students around data. But then it's important to explore how data can be used and how it can be represented. So in this, in particular, we use databases. Now we start with using spreadsheets, uh, which is essentially a two-dimensional database. And then we move to more complex databases, three-dimensional and relational databases. But the key aspect there is we learn how to query databases, how to create um, effective queries that only return the exact piece of data that we want. Now, this is different to a search. Um, used to doing searches, which is unstructured queries in Google and things like that, where you produce a list of responses based upon the search terms that you've used. A proper um, database query only re returns the exact piece of data that you want. And we design databases so that that will occur. And that's how what we call database design is conducted. And we use languages such as SQL or SQL, structured query language that we can use and knowing how the database is designed, it will return the exact piece of information we want. 
Now this is important if you've got a plane flying along and it's got to query its database and bring up some information on how to adjust the fuel flow, you want it to bring up that exact piece of information. Or more importantly for some, if you want your um, bank balance, you don't want a query of a whole range of bank balances from lots of different people. You want your exact bank balance. So there is a database set up that is done in a structured way and you create a structured query that returns that exact piece of data based upon the, your name, your account details, and the value of what is stored. So there are a range of tutorials such as SQL Zoo um, that can assist you in learning about um, structured query languages and database development. We don't go into full relational database development, um, but certainly, well, some schools still do, uh, but certainly querying and querying databases are an important part of digital technologies. Now the next aspect of information and data is around spatial representation of that data. And more commonly we call this maps, where we have a whole lot of information displayed in an image form that allows us to interpret that data and see the relationship of data to one another, such as the relationship based upon distance, how far apart on a piece of paper two dots are, give us a representation of how far apart two towns may be. And a squiggly line going between those two dots may be a representation of where a road travels between those two towns. And a whole range of other information that we can then overlay onto a map. And we can students can create their own maps and put their own data onto those maps. Um, and this is all called geospatial data. And of course, it's been popularized with um, Google Maps and Google Earth and tools such as that. But there are a whole range of aspects around data analysis in relation to maps. One popular activity is looking at flood data. And we can create a map that we can interactively change the water level and see which streets would be flooded and which wouldn't. And that can be used around disaster planning. Another one I used to do as a popular activity looked at crime data and it was so good you could actually query it and see how many of your how many times your neighbors had been arrested for various drug offenses and you could work out which of the houses in your neighborhood were likely to be drug dens um, and where murders had occurred and lots of other wonderful data that Queensland Police kindly made available but they then decided that this app was probably too useful for um, a whole range of purposes that they weren't planning for it to be useful for and so they closed down the use of that app but the data is still made available by the Queensland Police De Department but not in an easily searchable and constructible way so you could construct your own database that did the similar things but you would be restricted on making that publicly available but there's lots of other data activities that students can engage with with publicly available data such as getting all the surf data and creating an app that helps uh, people work out whether or not it's a good idea to go surfing at various beaches. Lots and lots of data is available. And in the tutorial, you're going to be exploring some of that data and looking at some of the applications that your students could use that data for to solve problems. Now, one aspect of data is, of course, there can be problems with the use of that data. We may have issues around trying to secure certain data that is private and confidential. And then we have the concept of hacking or breaking into that data and then using that data for purposes for which it wasn't meant to be used. Um, there's also issues around privacy and a whole range of other of those ethical aspects that we explore in digital technologies. Now, one of the first uh, concepts you need to be teaching students about is around encryption and decryption. How we can actually secure data so that if it is gained by someone else, they can't make use of it. So this was used with codes during wars where we would make a secret code that people that got that code couldn't decipher. And there are a range of different code encryption and decryption techniques that we can teach students. And I've given you a couple of examples that you'll go through in the tutorials and there are some video clips on those on the course notes. But then there are lots of issues around um, understanding of the risks involved with sharing data 
and sharing personal information online. And the Think You Know is a, a site developed by the government to help students understand the risks involved in sharing data online. And then there's also aspects around understanding the threat risk, how common it is for hacking events and uh, nefarious activities to occur. And there are a couple of websites that provide live data on those instances. And in the tutorial, we'll talk more about some of the risks and ways that we can go about uh, pre preparing students to understand those risks and to incorporate into their practices ways that mitigate those risks. Now, the final aspect I've given you some information on relates to wearable devices, which increasingly involve in the use of data. These of data, where we have devices that collect information about where we are, such as GPS and so forth. We use that for tracking purposes, and parents now regularly track their children based upon their mobile phone locations and things of that nature. But we've also got devices such as smart watches, where they can monitor people's health, um, whether or not they've had an accident, and then automatically call for assistance, and a whole range of other. Um, data collection processes that are being applied to solve problems and students can think about these and create their own solutions for those. Um, I've got a kit of, of um, smart watches that students can use, they're very simple little smart watches, but they detect other um, watches, or more like bracelets, within a certain range and you can program up to five other bracelets to detect when um, these bracelets are within that range, and particularly for girls, they've set them up so that they know when they've arrived at school. And so their bracelet will turn a different color or um, uh, make a sound when their friend comes within a certain distance. They can also tap the bracelet and send messages to each other where their bracelets will um, make a little vibration or sound or so forth, so they can send secret messages to each other in class and. A whole range of other things that they can use these wearable devices and program them to do these things in a way that is engaging for the students. So wearables are becoming a big thing, slowly, but increasingly we're going to see more and more of these technologies built into our clothing, our shoes, um, and certainly our eyeglasses, which is the next big thing around augmented reality, and of course smart watches and mobile devices that we carry with us have been around for a while now. But all of these can be programmed by students and utilised to solve problems.